Hi and welcome to Biotech's specialist webinar. I'm Lauri, the marketing and sales director here at Biotech. Glad to have you with us. Today's topic is this Activa IM nail, world's first bioresorbable intramedullary nail intended for pediatric diaphyseal forearm fractures. Today we have two excellent guests, Professor Anneli Weinberg and Dr. Marcel Varga from Without further ado, let's move forward for the topic and introduction. Professor Weinberg, please um, continue and start the presentation. Thank you very much. Hello again, all together. Before I start my talk, I just want to mention, if you have time, you always can go to the website of Biretic where you can see how the technique is working. Because today we really talk about indication and then we talk about first experience. So we see technique, but if you need further information, you have to go to the website. Um, let's have the first slide, please. So about what we are talking today, today. we are talking about the diaphyseal forearm, which means it's the quare of the physis distally where the diaphysis start. And we are not talking about proximal radius fracture or proximal um, metaphysical fracture of the ulna. So really about the diaphysis of the form. Next slide, please. Next. So if we are looking on uh, how uh, how is um, how can we classify these fractures, we know we can have complete fractures, which might be transfer or oblique. And we have the so-called green stick fractures. If you see on the right side, the first uh, mix ratio, a complete fracture. Above, you see green stick fracture and beyond fracture we also count to um, green stick fracture in the boring fracture you can't see the inf uh, infection um, of the corticalis in most cases next slide please here I just want to uh, start my talk with this x-ray what would you do conservative or operative treatment I guess at the end maybe people choose different ways but I think it's important to understand what are the the decision-making arguments for one or for the other treatment. Next. Next slide, please. So first we have to define what's the aim of the treatment. We don't want to have any functional deficit and the patient don't want to have any re reposition. It's always ugly and painful. And what's the best? No second anesthesia. anesthesia. So the goal for children is to have a primarily definitive treatment. And this has to be looked on that the patient's view of an optimal treatment has to be regarded. Next slide, please. Next. So question to be answered before decision making. When does the functional deficit occur? What is the capacity of spontaneous correction in the diaphragmatic shaft of the forearm? We, need, we know that we have a refracture in this area. We need to know which is the refracture rate. And we have to say by which kind of fracture type. And did we have a secondary displacement because the fracture itself is unstable? So these are the questions to be answered before decision making in any cases of form fracture. Next. Next slide. So what what can we see in the literature? What what is written in literature? If you look on the early and old literature, the people always said it's a good healing. Yes, for for sure, children always heal. They said we have not an actual alignment in ten to sixty cases, but we have a good spontaneous correction. But the pitfall, and this is also nowadays is seen that all fractures were put in one pot. pot. So metaphysical fracture have a good correction potential, but not in the diaphysis. In the diaphysis, we know that we could have a functional deficit if we have no axial alignment in between 5 to 15 degrees. What we know in literature is also that in former days, the people say, but you have a good compensation in the shoulder. So we can do conservative treatment if you don't have an alignment and we have restriction in prone supination, the shoulder can comp compensate. This is true. Next slide, please, please. And we also find literature that there are a lot of no, that you can have non-union, but this is also a rare case in form fractures and often seen after 
not often, could be seen after bed operation. But I don't want to go into the depths, but what is clear, the distal radius has a high capacity for spontaneous correction, the diaphysal not. Next. Next. So why we should take this in regard? Because nowadays you have to sit on the computer, you have to work with computer and it's quasi in every job. There you need a good pronation and this is why we are looking more for the um, movement of the form, which is the pro and supination. Next slide. If you look in literature and Crohn's prognosis, so we can say that the Crohn's arrest is clinically irrelevant in the upper extremity or in the forearm. We not often see it, but the spontaneous correction in the shaft is limited and it's really maximum 10 degree in the people uh, in the children over five years. So we also have to take into account which kind of alignment makes problem and which not. Next slide. Next. So we see here two cases. One has an excellent function, has a deviation of more than 10 degree in the forearm shaft. And the other one has only a slight deviation of 10 to 15 degrees and has no pronation. So why, why is this like this? And there is something we have to go back to the biomechanics. Next slide. If you have an ax axial deviation with, is behind the crossing of both bone, as both bone are move, moving, you have restrictions. So if you are proximal or it's a proximal forearm fracture, you have to be much more aware that you can have restriction, especially if the interosseous space is uh, narrowed or if you have a volar um, deviation um, of uh, of the radius. And this was the case of the second patient. He had a volar deviation. It was only 10, 15 degree and this makes it completely restricted. He has no pronation. So this is why we nowadays are looking more on this movement. Next slide. So summarize it. Volar or dorsal angulation are dominant to lead to functional deficit. Everything which narrowing the interosseous space, excess deviation proximal to the crossing of the both bones, and there also could be by five to 10 degrees that you have restriction. And all distal fracture behind the crossing of both bones, it's also for the diaphases, makes normally no deficit because you are out of the crossing over of the bone. Biomechanical, you not can limit your function. So this is a little bit important it's important but it's a little bit difficult to understand but you have to take as the whole me message everything in the middle and proximal you have to have an alignment if not you must be aware that you can have restriction in the rotation of the form if the um, bones are blocked then you have also a limitation in uh, movement next if you see here, if you are unsure, like this, this is really a slight deviation proximal. If you are not sure, makes this any problems or not? It's, 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 it's a green stick fracture. It's typical in this age. It's a five year old girl. Then what you can do after seven to 10 days after trauma, you can test it. It's important that you fix the epicondyle. This is always important when you check the movement of the forearm. You have to fix the epicondyle and then you have to turn around. You don't have to stretch stress it to maximum, but if you can overcome the neutral position, then it makes no restriction. Next. So here you see another problem we have with the forearm fracture. I mentioned it before, refracture rate. We know that the refracture rate is depending on the kind of fracture. So we know that green stick fracture as they have, um, um, the, the green stick fractures are those who has a high risk for real fracture. And if you look on the classification, only 10 to 20% are post bone green stick fracture, but they, those have, um, has the problems of refracture rate and the refracture is not always, could not be pre prevent if you put a cast for six weeks on the arm, you, because most of them are between eight to 20 weeks after post-trauma, but we see it until the eight months after trauma. And the refracture rate, we have done an investigation, is about 
it's a little bit in literature um, not really clear, but um, we found out in a big study almost 10%. Next slide. Here you see a typical case. It is a Boeing fracture. It was reducted and has the cast, and you see it was healed. And um, seven uh, weeks later, or eight weeks later, he broke his arm. He has a knee fracture rate, and as you see, um, the bone is in remodeling. Um, this is something where no patient has any more cast. The refractor rate is depending on the green stick um, problem. I did not mention before, but you know, on one side you have a good healing, on the other side you have a slow healing, and it's hepatized that this makes this different and that this, this leads to refractor rate. But um, it's missing really good experimental study, and we have no setup until now for. Um, really um, can um, 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 verify this hypothesis. Next slide, please. Here you see we can operate. Uh, we, we operate the case with a titanium nail. This is always tricky because refracture. You can have a blocked intramedullary canal. So sometimes you have to open it. You, you, you have to drill the bone to open the canal that you can insert a nail who is big enough. Um, but I not want to go into the depth because um, we today want to talk about the fresh form fractures more or less. So next slide. Here you see also decision making. If you have an unstable fracture like here, for uh, it's not a problem to reduce it and put a cast on it. But as you see, you have a redislocation. It might minimize your function. And if you want to have an alignment for the, the patient and only one treatment, this is a fracture who has to be fixed. It's an unstable fracture. And in most cases, you, you can bring it home with cast, but it has a lot of effort and is for the patient often painful and needs several anesthesia. How to check it? I always, the people are asking if you have reducted. You have to move a little bit the arm. If you at once get a secondary displacement, you have to fix it with nails. So in my clinic, you never do a reposition in this patient without any anesthesia, that you have the possibility to fix them. And I'm very excited to use the IM, IM nail to fix such a fracture. Next slide, please. So. Um, some countries do a cast wedging. This is a very nice method. But I know that a lot of countries are not able to do it. This is the chance to do, to prevent secondary dislocation with a certain technique of casting, but it is in most clinics not available. So we do a uh, definitive fixation if you have unstable fracture in our clinic. Next slide. Next slide. So in summarizing this, what is the goal for making decisions? First is that we don't want to have a functional deficit. This means we have to know which kind of axial deviation makes a limiting, limit, limited the function. So we know if the, if the factor is proximal, slight deviation could make a an, an restriction in function. Next is that we know that um, if the um, axial deviation narrows the interosseous base, we get functional deficit, or if we have a volar or dorsal um, deviation of the radius. The spontaneous correction is, despite a lot wrong literature, not very high. We have in young children 5 to 10 percent, but in older ones, you often get only more Boeing, but not really, not really a spontaneous correction. So we can cannot trust on spontaneous correction, especially in the middle or proximal part. Then we have the refracture rate. We have to discuss with the, with the patient because green stick fracture you always can also treat perfectly conservative because normally they are stable. They are stable fracture because only one corticalis is broken. But you have to say in 10%, 10 to 15%, you get a refracture. And so you have to discuss with the patient if you need a reduction and you go in the operation room, you have to discuss with him if he wants to have a definitive treatment. In my clinic, no IMLs um, are 
uh, removed before six months. First, decision making is no secondary displacement. This is in our country a goal. So we need or we want to give the patient a definitive treatment at the end of any anesthesia. We have to check if the um, bone is stable or not stable. So it's always a question of amount of your effort you do. And we know that we have success in a lot of ways. But this is something you have also decided in your clinic. I can al also say this is my goal and this is my um, prescription to treat those fractures. Um, but these are the decision making um, arguments. So I guess now I give over the talk to Marcel to talk about the first experience because we operate from fractures, have fracture if they are unstable, if we have intrinsic fracture with an deviation where we need an anesthesia for reduction, then we probe the other corticalis and put some nails in it. And it would be fantastic if we don't have to remove the nails further on. So that's why I'm very curious about the first um, experience of Marcel with this um, new material and new technique. Thank you very much. Yeah, last slide is only that we have a trend towards operative treatment. This is for sure. We Thank have you. a trend for operative treatment. Thank you, Professor Weinberg. Thank you for the great introduction to the topic. And without further ado, let's move forward to Dr. Varka and the intramural nailing with the Activa IM nails. So thank you for your attention. Uh, I'm very proud that I can speak about Activa IM nail and about our first experiences. I have to clarify that these are really our first experiences because we operate with Activa IM nail only since three months. So please or my first slide. Well, uh, I'm working in the National, uh, National Trauma Center of Hungary. It is the Manninger Jenő National Trauma Center, and we have got a special, special department. This is the Department of Pediatric Trauma. And our indication of the azine technique for pediatric forearm fractures when there is no chance for an anatomic reduction by conservative treatment and no chance for maintaining the fracture in this position or closed and at most grade one open fractures of the diaphysis, unstable fractures. And of course, it is also an essential condition that the child should have open growth plates. We operate about 80 till 100 pediatric forearm fractures yearly, and our gold standard operation method is titanium elastic nail. Of course, sometimes we use plates, but mostly our first choice, if there is no contraindication, is a titanium elastic nail and the azine technique. Our first operation with IM Activa nail was the middle of September. Next slide, please. And uh, uh, I was very surprised when we were talking with colleagues that the surgical protocols with the azine technique are very different, even with the azine technique, which we think it is a very uniform technique. It is not. I will say only about our practice. We don't use any immobilization after elastic nails. We remove the nails after seven till 10 months because of the rate of refracture. And we usually use the distal radial entry point. Sometimes when the fracture is very distal, we use the dorsal entry nail, but we don't like this entry nailing point because of the chance of, of uh, extensor polyps longest tendon injury. And we use the conventional proximal entry point in the cases of ulna. Next slide, please. Please, the next slide. I don't see it now. Yes, when we choose, uh, when we think about Activa EM nail, we have to clarify a few things. It, uh, uh, there are advantages of the azine technique and advantages of the Activa IM nail as well, but there are also disadvantages. Azine nailing is a very stable osteosynthesis. There's no need for postoperative immobilization. 
while active IM nailing needs, requires post-operative immobilization in an above the elbow cast. And it is not so stable after operation, but these nails show a tendency to swell. So the stability increases in the first 24 hours after operation. Uh, the greatest advantage of active IM nail that it doesn't require any removal. And the ends of the nails shouldn't be palpated. It can be hammered to the level of the bone, while in the case of as in technique, we should have left a little part of the nail outside the bone. And this is why it causes sometimes skin irritation and soft tissue irritation. Please, the next slide. Uh, uh, the surgical technique is very similar, but it is very important. It is not the same as an as in technique because implant properties are totally different. We can see here it is a very elastic implant and we don't have the chance to reduce with this implant. We use other so-called dilatators to make a reduction. Please, the next slide. It can be very frustrating for a trauma surgeon when he does his operation or her operation. Uh, we don't see the whole implant. We see only a small part of the implant. This is the TCP labeling. And as we can see here, only this small part is visible on the fluoroscopy. But this small part uh, shows us where is the nail uh, momentary. So we have to be accustomed to this picture because we won't see the whole implant because the, the PLGA materia is invisible to fluoroscopy. Next slide, please. And here we can see if we could uh, start the video with the, please the video, I, I hope it will start. Yes, here we can see uh, our surgical technique. It is almost the same. The patient is in a supine position. The arm is on a radiolucent table. Here we can see an unstable fracture. It is very unstable, a little girl. And we do the steps of the operation under fluoroscopy. Here we can see the radial entry nailing. After we open the medullary canal, we set this so-called dilatator. It is almost the same as an elastic titanium nail, but it is not made of titanium. It is a metal alloy nail. I can bend it. It is almost so elastic than a titanium nail. And the importance of this dilatator is very great because first with this dilatator, I make my reduction similarly as I would make with an elastic nail. Here we can see the technique with the special inserter. I make the reduction, I try to go through the fracture gap and try to find the medullary canal of the distal, uh, distal fracture part. After successful, uh, successful reduction, it is very important I should do this back and forth movement. I, can, I have to do a successful dilatation. I have to make enough space for the bioabsorbable nail, because with the bioabsorbable nail, I won't have the possibility to make my reduction. And if, if the nail becomes stuck in the medullary canal, I have to remove the bioabsorbable nail and try to make a dilatation again with a more thicker uh, dilatator. So here we can see as I make uh, the ulnar dilatation with this back and forth movement to make enough space for the bioabsorbable nail, I have to do space enough and I have to choose the most thickest implant I have. Here we can see as the dilatators are on the place, I check my reduction and now the most difficult part of the operation comes because I have to remove the dilatators and I have to maintain my reduction. This is the point when I take my bioabsorbable nail into the inserter and I try to find my hole and I slip the bioabsorbable IM nail into the medullary canal. Here we can see the technique. In this state of the operation, I don't have the possibility to hammer it. I, the nail should slip without any problem very easily 
through the manulary canal and through the fracture. Here we can see uh, as the nail is in the ulnar side, I, I take it forward and it should slip without any problem, without any barrier. Here I can see the TCP labeling on the fluoroscopy where I am momentarily. And with this special instrument, I can, I can burn the end of the unnecessary part of the nail. And with light hammer blows, I, I take the implant to the level of the bone, only a small one or two millimeter or, or even, even nothing. And here we can see I cut the unnecessary part of the ulnar nail. And with light hammer blow again, I hammer it to the level of the bone, just not to, just uh, that there shouldn't be any problem later with skin irritation. And as we can see, this is the final uh, picture. I made a stability test. It seems very stable, of course, and it seems very stable clinically, but I have to emphasize again, this kind of operation cannot be let without any any cast, any immobilization. So we have to use some kind of immobilization. Momentary for the time being, the recommended immobilization is an above the elbow cast. Okay, let's move forward, please. No, no, okay, thank you. So now the official indications of active IM nailing uh, is diaphysal forearm fracture uh, in the presence of appropriate immobilization and between the age of three and 13. I hope in the future, this age limit will be more, more uh, wider, but momentary, this is or these are our possibilities. Please, I would like the next slide. Okay, and I would like to show a few cases of few patients of or here this was our first patient an eight years old boy who fall during some sport activity in the school next slide please and we uh, choose uh, operation with IM nails here we can see the intraoperative pictures with the dilatators inside next slide please here we can see the TCP labeling these are intraoperative pictures next slide please and here we can see the result, the post-operative day and the first week. We gave him an above the elbow cast. Next slide, please. And here we can see the four weeks pictures. We can see callus formation, moderate callus formation, the fracture gap still visible. Next slide, please. And after eight weeks, we have we can see how well he is. There is a very impressive callus formation. The fracture gap is almost invisible. And as we can see the next video, please, and we can see in the videos, he's moving and without any problem, even he can do push-ups as well. Next slide. She was a, an 11 years old girl, a very elite, a, a very elite uh, sports uh, girl. She was falling during sport activity and uh, this unstable fracture she has suffered. Next slide, please. We have chosen intramedullary IM nailing. Here we can see the intraoperative pictures. Next slide, please. And here we can see the post-operative uh, post X-ray. And this is the immediate post-operative X-ray. Next slide, please. Here we can see X-rays after two weeks. There was no pain. It was a very stable osteosynthesis. And this girl was very disciplined and self-restrained. So we choose a band above the elbow cast and we gave her a short removable brace and she was doing fine with this brace. Of course, she was very careful. Next slide, please. And there was no problem with this. We can see a moderate callus formation after six weeks. Next slide, please. And here we can see the pictures at 10 weeks, a very impressive bone healing. And next slide, please. And here we can see her function. Again, she can do push-ups. She is very eager to go back to elite sport. We are a little careful. We let her uh, many activities, but the elite uh, sport activity still, she, we don't let her to do. Next slide, please. A very uh, an eight years old girl. Next slide, please. 
again an unstable fracture a little more distal one week and three weeks later we can see the pictures next slide please and here we can see callus formation after three after three weeks it is always a question if sh we should give her a short cast a long cast only a brace or we shouldn't give her anything because she will be careful this callus formation is uh, is enough to maintain the fracture now still we are very careful so, so we gave her after three weeks a long cast a uh, short cast sorry next slide please and here we can see the pictures after five weeks please next slide and here we can see the function after five weeks almost total uh, movement of the forearm or total no restriction and no pain and there will be no need for implant removal next slide please it was a very interesting case. This poor boy has got a very severe congenital syndrome, uh, which affects many of his organs. And his other hand is a clap hand, who is a candidate for an operation later. But his only, uh, only health arm was fractured, and it was a refracture. Earlier, he had a fracture, and it was treated conservatively. So he had a refracture, and he, ha he also had a very severe blood clotting disease and we have chosen intramedullary nailing the anesthesia was very difficult because this congenital malformation next slide please and we were successful this was a refractured but the medullary canal was open still and we hadn't need to open it so we were able to do it in a closed way here we can see the picture with the dilatators next slide please and now he can see the one we can see the one week x-rays next slide and here we can see his function after three weeks we can see even callus formation no restriction of course we gave him a short cast after three weeks and next slide please and we can see his picture after eight weeks i think it is a very impressive bone healing uh, the fracture line still visible but it seems very stable, so no need any further immobilization, no need for further cast. Next slide, please. And it is a special case. Again, it was a combined fracture when with the forearm fracture, there was also a supracondylar humeral fracture. It is the nightmare of every, every pediatric surgeon. Next slide, please. And we stabilized the elbow with key wires and the forearm with I am nails. Next slide, please. After here, we can see after a few weeks at uh, the immediate X rays. Next slide, please. After uh, three weeks, there is a callus formation around the elbow and callus formation around the forearm. Next slide. Uh, here we can see the callus formation. Next time. Next slide. And after six weeks, we have uh, removed the key wires in an outpatient way. And next slide, please. And we can see her function now. The forearm function is, is almost or it is perfect. There's only a small restriction of the elbow extension, but we think this is rather due to the supracondylar humeral fracture. And we hope within the next few weeks, these little restriction will decrease. Next slide, please. And, and again, a very special case, it was a refracture, even a refracture can occur when the titanium nail is still inside. And we removed the nail and we replaced this nail with an iron nail. I think it is really a very special case. We have stabilized the ulna as well because we have seen a small bending with the ulna and the forearm was stabilized with two 3.3 millimeters, so the most thickest IM nail. And the picture, what we can see, and this is after one day of operation. Of course, this, uh, this state without the cast was only for the video. We have, give, we have gave him an above the plaster cast, but in his case, there was no pain and the, the fracture was very stable. So he was able to move his forearm without any pain, even after 24 hours of operation. Next, time, next slide, please. 
Next slide, please. And here's a complete forearm fracture with a very stable osteosynthesis. Again, the most thickest IMAs was, were put inside, and this boy was able to move his hand without his forearm, without any pain after 24 hours. Of course, in his case, we gave him above the elbow plaster cast, as the recommendation is, but I hope later in the future, the immobilization time will be reduced dramatically, even with iron nails. Next slide, please. And uh, I would like to share a few tricks because the technique seems very easy, but sometimes it is not. It is a recommendation that we shouldn't bend the end of the nail, this TCP end, because it can cause problem in the nail. Sometimes, and this is not a routine, when the reduction has displaced but just a little, we can bend the end of the nail. And with this little trick, sometimes it is easier to go through in the, in the fracture gap, but this shouldn't be a routine. Uh, uh, in two cases, we have bended the end of the nail and there was no fracture, no problem uh, with this. Next slide, please. And if uh, uh, dilatation requires a very great force, perhaps a more traditional nail inserter, a T-chuckle, may also be used. And sometimes when uh, the dilatation is not enough, a more conventional elastic nail also may be used. Next slide, please. And uh, it can be a problem again that this TCP uh, doesn't... Uh, uh, um, is not visualized well. So when we work with different fluoroscopy machines, perhaps we have to check it if this TCP labeling can be seen well, and per perhaps there will be a little need for setting or fluoroscopy machine to see this TCP end well. Next slide, please. And the questions of the future, as I mentioned, for the time being, I see the greatest disadvantage of this technique, the post-operative immobilization. Now the official recommendation is a three till six weeks of above the elbow cast, or according to the standard protocols of the hospital. Now we use an above the elbow cast, but it will be a question which tried which above the elbow cast should be changed even after one week to a short cast and which child is able to wear a short cast. So it will be, I think, a question of the future. Uh, next slide, please. Currently, once again, I would like to emphasize we strongly recommend the post-operative immobilization with an above the elbow cast. Next slide, please. And uh, these are the purse and pitfalls, uh, the summarizing which uh, I have mentioned earlier. Next slide, please. And here we can see of all results. These are the first 13 children we have operated with Activa Nail. We have seen only one very small complication. There was a small loss of reduction in one little girl. It was the degree, it was an isolated radial fracture, but the degree of, of red displacement was under 10 degrees, and she is under 10, so we hope it will remodel with time. I think this was rather due to a bad surgical technique because we used an open reduction and uh, the thinner nail, only one nail, we inserted. So it was perhaps due to this, but only a few degrees of red displacement has occurred and now she has almost the perfect function. But of course, there is no surgical technique without complication. Until now, we have seen no implant irritation no septic complication, but of course, uh, only a very short time has occurred since we have started this wonderful technique. Next slide, please. And here, this is a very interesting picture. I think we have made some ultrasound examinations as well. This is a further advantage of the biodegradable nail that it won't cause I, or we hope it won't cause soft tissue irritation. If we see this picture, we can see a traditional elastic nailing, and we can see the ultrasound picture. Uh, on the X-ray, it seems that the nail is at the level of the bone, but in the real time, it is not. 
there is almost uh, five millimeters of titanium nail outside the bone, and we can see a pseudo bursa around the bone. This finding what we see many times when we remove the nail, and this is what, what usually causes a soft tissue irritation or skin irritation, and this is why we sometimes have to remove the nail earlier that we have planned. And if we can see the picture, the ultrasound picture after an active nail, we can see that only a one or two millimeter of nail is outside the bone. No pseudobulsa formation around the implant. It is, it is indeed a very tissue friend implant. Next slide, please. And I think the question if the future will be not which method I should choose. This is not a newer method. This is not a, a or, or it can be a much more modern method, of course. But the Ezin technique has got its own advantages, and still it will have. And the IM nail has it, its own advantages as well. So I think for the time now, I can present to the parents both the methods. If I choose as in method, I can say there will be no postoperative immobilization. He can go back to sport uh, sooner. If I choose I am nailing, there will be no need for a second uh, removal. Which one you would like to choose? And I think in the future, when these instruments will, will develop, perhaps one day, uh, these biabsorbable nails will be so strong that there will be no need for postoperative immobilization. And I hope in the future we will have intramedullary nails, not just in the forearm, but in other parts as well. Next slide, please. And thank you for your attention. I hope you heard me well. And I hope there will be many, many questions. Thank you very much. Dr. Varga, for the excellent presentation and very nice cases. Possible, Dr. Varga, is it possible to bend the dilator? Yes, definitely. Uh, as I say, you sometimes you have to bend the dilatators, like in a conventional as in technique. When I use as in, I bend the nail, the end of the nail for the reduction for maneuvering with the nail. You can you can bend it. It is almost the dilatator is very similar to an as in nail. Almost no difference. Okay. It is a, a little more rigid. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Professor Weinberg. Uh, there's a question regarding uh, your your presentation. The first one, the introduction part, and and combining this to the active IM nail, there is the three point tension in the intraosseous membrane. What's the possibilities and how do you see that with, with Activa IM nail? First of all, I want to say congratulations to this excellent talk and impressive cases. I, I really um, enjoyed it and um, I'm happy that we have now something like this that we can offer to the patient. The patient is in the middle of our issues. Um, I have to say, in my opinion, this technique is a little bit diverse from ASIN technique because you do not a three point bending or something like spread the interosseous membrane if you bend the nails like you do in the titanium version. The trick in this technique is that you are trying to be in the medullary canal as thick as possible. So it's more like conventional naming. It's not so the bending you need. And then with the swelling of the implant means that with water or fluid, the nails getting a li little bit thicker, they um, interact much better with the bone. And this is different to Isin technique. Isin never change in shape. So that's with the three bending you, you're trying to, to repone indirect to the fracture. And with this, you do it because it's swollen and, and the bones get in contact in the anatomical position because you feel the intermedullary canal. Yeah. And, and uh, at least it's arm where you are not do a three-point bending. The three-point bending is more when you use two nails in a single bone. Um, what you can do is with bending that you spread the inter uh, osseous membrane um, um, in form fractures. It's not a three point bending. It's not really a three point bending in the form. 
And it is a very interesting observations of ours. This was the same question before of ours before we begin our operations, that in the post-operative first day, we don't see greater pain of the ch children than after and as inhaling. So, and this is just an impression. The pain uh, somehow seems a little less for me, but that's sure that the pain is not greater than after and as inhaling. So, and it is an un indirect uh, evidence that these nails uh, gives us a very stable uh, fixation in the bones because no micromobility. Mm -hmm. And this is the key point, I guess, for all of of the factor treatment. As stable is it, it is or becomes less pain and this is also the question does we need a cast or this we will answer when we have more cases a little bit yeah. precise yes. more precise well professor weinberg what, what do you think about the material affecting the callus formation so now we have not enough experience but it seems to me because this material is also used in other indication where we fix fractures etc so you have a long-standing experience with it and there's not any publication about it. The fracture itself and the colors is always depending on the stability or instability. So I think the most key is that you use really a thick nail and trying to get a thick one in and not a 2.0 because this might be too small and makes instability at the fracture side. And then we have, have hypertrophic colors maybe. We have not seen in these cases, but I guess when we have more experience might be this could be a reason in for the material itself there's nothing in the literature saying to this point you know mm -hmm. so we fix other fracture with the pins and with um with other um, implants from your company so there was not written anything about the colors irritation or that there's no colors and what i also have to say for immobilization, this comes just in my mind, and I want to say, as you know, when we have callus formation, then it is the bone, you know? And if you treat the bone and we see callus in three out of four corticalis, then it's healed. That's my education. Then we need nothing. If you see in three out of four corticalis callus, then it's healed. Mm -hmm. So you can remove everything. But this is a kind of education, I guess. I don't know, because this is a question always the people ask. And if it's yeah. healed, it's healed. And after two weeks, after two weeks, we have a situation where the bone has colors, which is not visible, but it's around the bone and it's like chewing gum, you know. But then sure. I, would yeah, ask, Dr. I, I would ask something, Professor Weinberg. If you see a callus formation, only a moderate callus formation and a great fracture gap still visible. Okay, we say we can let this girl or boy without any cast, but what about sport activity? What would you suggest? If he or she can go back if he or she is an elite sport, uh, uh, do those elite, elite uh, sport? Yeah, what is your opinion? No when, when is the time to go back to very strong sport activity? I, I tell you, now we have a typical question a lot of people ask me. The first is that I said, move what you can without any pain. And if you are at school, they will play soccer. But I said, normally for eight weeks, not do any sports in, in elite position, whatever elite is. Um, what I always said, if a fracture is healed, it's healed, you have the possibility to refracture it's in any case it's everywhere and the child is moving also in the school in the school you have um, times where they are running they play soccer during pauses so i said they should try what i trying to do with elite sports kids i always discuss what do you think when you can win your game or whatever it is do you think you can win a game when you are injured and not fit and Every child said, no, I can't win. And I said, yes. And so we limit it for eight weeks or 12 weeks. It's depending which kind of sport it is. Because sometimes, you know, if it's a sport where you have another person who can attack you, it's difficult. Yes. Then it's not up yes. to the person. It's not up to the movement of the person. Yes. Then it could happen. 
it is not an easy and it is a very difficult question. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. But I'm trying to involve the patient. I'm trying to involve the patient. What would you do if there would be a refracture with an active IM nail? Uh, it's time depending. It's early to the fracture, near the fracture gap, then open there and put it out. If you don't have it, then sometimes you can drill it because you can spread the rest of the nail away and put mm -hmm. something in. Or you just do a plate with screws on it, then you can go through the intermedullary canal without any problems. Because this material is not strong enough to re, um, retract um, screws or drilling. Yeah. Dr. Varga, the question to you. What kind of setup do you use in the fluoroscopy? Uh, can you use the conventional fluoroscopy machines uh, to see the TCP tip? Or what's your uh, advice in that? Yes, uh, I think every fluoroscopy machine is different. And I hadn't said that the TCP cannot be seen, but uh, perhaps uh, some fluoroscopy machine uh, show other pictures. So before I do the operation, if you use different fluoroscopy machine before the operation, you should check it if you can see the end well. And uh, that sometimes there are need for small uh, adjustment because it can be very frustrating when you are uh, inside the bone and you, you, find, you look for the sign of the TCP where it is. And if it doesn't seem so well, it can be it can be a bad situation but uh, it is always can be seen but but uh, perhaps with small adjustment uh, the visualization becomes better and it is and, it is different uh, for every every machines and then another question for dr varka uh, how do you control the soft tissue uh, post operatively so what what are your ways to control that there is no soft tissue irritation? Soft tissue irritation can happen if the ends of the nail irritate the skin. If a very long part of the nails are left outside, then they can cause skin irritation. If I remove a great amount from the nail and only one or two millimeters is left outside, I think there will be no skin irritation. So this is a very small but very important part of the operation that you have to be very careful with the, with the cutting at the, in the end. We do not remove our titanium nails at all. What is your view on this? Professor Weinberg first and then Dr. Varga. Yeah. Um, this is a discussion who popped up several years because it cost money to remove nails. In my opinion, we know that titanium always do precipitation means that nano irons from the alloying system go into the tissue. This is this trigger the immune system. That's why new alloying system are developed for titanium, where we um, put out the uh, neoptene or vanadium and trying to replace it. So the main problem is up to now it's not forbidden and it's very difficult to test it. You can test it, and we have series of people who have. Um, 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 a trigger to the immune system. Up to now, we can't um, estimate it and we can't look into the future. It's a little bit, I always compared it to the climate problems. You know, it's too late when you recognize that it makes or harms the body. And in children, I would always remove implants because this, you have your whole life, the precipitation. Every alloying system gives irons to your body. And we know there are ions which are not normally in our body. For sure, you also get them from outside, from everywhere. But I don't want to put it into a body and say, I have done it. I mean, if we have trigger for the immune system, we have it. So everybody has to just touch, touch, touch on this by itself. But I know yeah. that it's yeah. in some country like this. It is. But but it's I think there are more more reasons to remove the nails, not just because the immune system. Uh, I think around most surgeons around the world remove the nails, not just because of the immune system, that uh, after a few years there will be a so great osteointegration that the nail uh, that, that is almost impossible to remove the nails. And if there is any other problem, like a fracture near the nail, like, uh, like some kind of pathology, it will be a very hard situation. And another problem can be the skin irritation I mentioned earlier, 
So the, the properties of a titanium nail and the soft tissues are very different. So sometimes we see a great inflammation with ultrasound around the end of the nails, uh, even if the patient has got no uh, uh, complaint. So we, in our practice, we, we remove every nail, even, uh, even after refractures, only after one year. So, of course, there are many ways to treat children. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I, I believe, that, yeah. Yeah, I, I only can commend that adult surgeons discuss yeah. sin, this since years. And if you have a fracture, you every time get something out. You have not this osteointegration because... It, it, it's not this problem. What you have is that the bone is still growing and it's overgrowth. Mm -hmm. So it's not so easy to remove it. Up to one year, it's easy, but then it's getting more demanding because it's growing. So it's in the canal and you can't open it easily to get it out. But if you have a fracture, then you have to open it. And inside, you said as a pediatric surgeon, sure, that's more complicated. It's more difficult, you know. Mm -hmm. But the adult always said when it's happened, we can remove it. So it's a little bit a telling to touch on it, but economics pressure make it that they don't remove implants. Mm -hmm. But um, in my opinion, it's not correct for the children. Thank you very much. Thank you both for uh, great presentations and discussions. Uh, there are interesting topics. More about the topics and what to do, how to use details about the implants, you can find on biotech.com from our website. And please remember to subscribe to our newsletter. Thank you both for the presentation and hope that everybody says stay safe and uh, specialist webinars continue in 2021. Thank you all and have a, a nice end of the year. Thank, Thank you. you very much and be healthy, be healthy everybody over the bye world. Bye.